gospel message. So we're going to open our service this morning by standing and singing hymn number 249 in our blue hymn books. How sure the scriptures are, God's vital, urgent word. So let's please stand and sing hymn number 249. say together the prayer of preparation which you can find on the top of page two in our service book. And we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom those secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firm in resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. And we will use the form of confession at the top of page three, as we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, 
and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And would you please stand as we say together the glory, which is on page five. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect for today the Sunday next before Lent. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, Amen. Amen. And would you please sit as Liz comes, Liz comes forward uh, to give us our first reading. Our Bible reading this morning is from Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. <coughs> this can be found on page 1024 of the Church Bibles. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, this is the word of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Good morning. I'm Christopher Hicken, and we're working through the formal order of this uh, communion service. We've reached the gospel reading. We've just heard what I'm going to call St. Mark's finale, the final passage from his gospel. So, this is the gospel of the Lord. What is the gospel and how is it part of our worship? 
Gospel means good news, and the good news is about Jesus. The first four books of the New Testament are called Gospels <clears throat> because they focus on the life, teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus. St. Mark opens his Gospel with the words, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. <clears throat> the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. The good news, the gospel, is about Jesus. <clears throat> His first words in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 15, are, The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Something momentous is happening. God is beginning to take charge and we are called to repent. As we heard recently, <clears throat> repent goes a bit beyond just saying sorry. We turn away from our old self-centered lives and start a whole new life. Our reading, St. Mark's finale, promises us dramatic consequences, authority over the enemy, and healing for people who are sick. I don't recommend deliberately going out and handling snakes, though a few churches have tried it. And what's remarkable, I read somewhere, is that so few people have died as a consequence. Um, it's not about that. Um, this comment is there to remind us of what happened to St. Paul when he was gathering firewood and a snake crawled out onto his arm, but he was unharmed. If we follow Jesus, we will face danger. But God is there with us in the danger. So, how do these dramatic consequences follow from Jesus' opening announcement? Repent and believe the good news. How does it work? Well, if you want to find out some, how something works, one way is to take it to bits, have a good look at the bits, and then put, it, put them back together. Now that last stage, putting it back together, is vital where the Bible is concerned. During the last century, there was far too much taking the Bible to bits and then wondering why it didn't work. Our first piece is the passage read to us, St. Mark's finale, Jesus sending out his disciples with the promise of signs following the word. The second piece for this morning's purposes is the rest of St. Mark's Gospel. Your Bibles rightly point out that the passage we've just heard does not appear in the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel. You can actually see this for yourself if the British Library have on display one of their greatest treasures, the Codex Sinaiticus, a fourth century almost complete Bible in Greek. In it, St. Mark's Gospel ends full stop just before the passage which was read to us which means that Mark's gospel originally ended with the words, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Which is a bit of a puzzle to say the least. It's really no surprise that very soon someone thinking along the lines of, you can't just leave it there, has added the passage we just heard, which I'm calling St. Mark's finale. It quotes from St. Matthew, Jesus sending out the disciples, St. Luke, various resurrection appearances, and then gives us a, a kind of film trailer for the Book of Acts. The quotes aren't very precise, and this is one reason why, for me, the Bible doesn't work if you treat it like a tablet of stone. It's far too alive, and for me, its status is that of expert witness. If, in a court of law, the witnesses all produce statements which agree word for word, it's likely they have colluded, and this undermines their testimony. But if there's broad agreement with minor discrepancies, as is outstandingly the case with the various accounts of Jesus' resurrection, that suggests we have records of several independent eyewitnesses. The Bible brings us expert witness to the dealings of God with humanity, and we ignore its testimony at our peril. So, what about the original ending of St. Mark's Gospel? They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. 
was the original ending lost? There's been a romantic suggestion that St. Mark was arrested in the middle of writing it and carried off to martyrdom. Possibly, but recently Bible scholars have begun to wonder whether this abrupt ending is not in fact deliberate. There's an excellent video on YouTube by one of our local theologians, Paula Gooder, who is on the staff of St. Mark's Cathedral. If you search on YouTube for Paula Gooder, uh, you will probably find her video about Mark's Gospel, or you can search for Paula Gooder Mark's Gospel. In it, she explains how St. Mark seems to be deliberately setting us a puzzle. And she shows this throughout the course of the gospel. The crowds are, we see Jesus. Who is Jesus? We see him teaching, healing people, proclaiming God's love and power. The crowds are amazed. The religious leaders can't stand him. His disciples seem totally perplexed. So, what about you? Who do you say this man is? The gospel, this good news, is calling us to a decision. It's not just his teaching or even his miracles or even his courage in the face of death. The disciples are devastated. But then come reports that he is risen from the dead. It must have been a complete shock. Think about it, says St. Mark. So St. Mark's question is, who is Jesus? Can I put this to you? Anyone like to have a go? God the Son. God the Son. Any advance on God the Son? That is a, yes, yes. Second person of the Trinity. Right, good, yes, yeah. We're deep into our established Christian faith there. God the Son is actually the only answer St. Mark actually gives us. And do you remember who actually says that in the Gospel? Peter. Sorry? Peter. Peter said he's Messiah. And the, I think that the problem with that is the Messiah is a conquering hero, so everybody thinks. And that's why... Is it um, the centurion? It's the centurion, yes, the pagan, the, uh, um, the outsider. The centurion at the cross says, surely this is the Son of God. And he does say the Son of God in St. Mark's Gospel. Um, that's the centurion's answer. The Son of God, the hint that something that God is at work in Jesus, that God is actually in Jesus, bringing us to the second person of the Trinity, eventually. We get there, thank you. Son of God, through Jesus, God has acted to bring in his kingdom. This is the news that we, just like the first disciples, have been given to take to the whole creation. The call is to repent from our own old selfish lives and take on the life of God's kingdom, our new life in Jesus, whereby we become who we truly are, life that will see us through into eternity. And as, as I was writing this, I was thinking, I'm like the author of St. Mark's Finale, I'm pulling ideas from all over the New Testament and beyond, trying to express the glory of the gospel. The St. Mark's Finale doesn't mention the Holy Spirit, but I can imagine the author saying, look, I've told you about the signs. I'm not going to rehash the whole of the book of Acts. Go and read it for yourself. So in fact, the great contribution of St. Mark's Finale, this last passage we just heard read, the great contribution to the whole of the gospel story is this promise of signs that will follow the proclamation of the word. Notice we are speaking of the word in three different senses, though they are closely linked. There's the word, which is the message about Jesus that we are sent to proclaim. The word, which is the Bible, our expert witness to the truth about Jesus and the word which is Jesus himself, God's ultimate revelation of himself and his love. So, the pieces are coming back together. Who is Jesus? He is Son of God, risen from the dead, and signs will follow the word. 
So Mark's finale is linked to the rest of his gospel by the all important phrase, go and tell. In the original ending at verse seven, just before the finale, they don't, the, um, the angel at the tomb, and Sir Mark just calls him a young man, tells the women to go and tell. They don't at first, they're scared, but they must have done eventually. And I can identify with that, taking some time to get my courage up when the Lord asks me to do something scary. In the finale, verse 15, Jesus now tells the disciples to go and tell. And we have the wonderful assurance that the Lord confirms the word with signs that accompany it. So how do we please God? By attending to his word and being doers of the word and not hearers only. This is why in our public and private worship, we read the gospels to discover and be reminded of the life, the teaching, self-sacrificing death and astonishing resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, God's Son, Savior. The message now entrusted to us in the words of N.T. Wright, the New Testament is therefore designed, designed, I would say, by the Holy Spirit, to be the book which, when we read it, shapes and energizes and directs us, not only for worship, but also for mission. Worship and mission go hand in hand. Reading and studying the New Testament is the vital and non-negotiable means whereby both are given their pattern and their power. So let's go and tell and stand by for action. The church is leaving the building. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for your words, Chris. I invite you now to stand, and we're going to uh, state the principles of our faith by using the words of the Creed, which we can find on page seven. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And would you please sit or kneel as we come to our time of prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. And let us thank God for his goodness. Strengthen all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth. Live together in your love, 
and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, continue to bless our religious leaders and particularly our bishops, Christopher and Jonathan, with wisdom and authority. And Lord, we have celebrated the retirement of Bishop Jonathan this week with his last service in Croydon on Thursday evening. Lord, bless him and his wife, Alison, with a long and healthy retirement in the Orkney Islands. And we give thanks for all that he has achieved in Croydon, and particularly for education in our diocese. And Lord, while we consider the words from Chris this morning, the followers were commanded by Jesus to go to all the world and preach the good news to all creation. We are advised that whoever believes will be saved. This was the last command of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. So may we all take heart as believers that Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead, and is still with us as we face dangers in our lives each day, and still confirms his word by signs in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that men may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, we pray for our leaders and government, and given the situation in our country, bless all our leaders with wisdom, honesty, insight and a concern for the common good. Lord, we pray for those involved in leading our church here in Perry, and particularly for Doug, Lisa, Steve, and Simon. And Lord, may you hold Doug in, her, in your hands at this time as he recovers from COVID and bless and care for his family. Yesterday, we received an email message from Chris Elston. Many of you may know Chris as a former teacher from Christ Church School who is now based in Moldova, and I will read his message. In the last hour, I have watched a report from Lucy Williamson of the BBC News from a border crossing into Moldova from the Ukraine. She reports that 30,000 Ukrainians have crossed into Moldova so far. Many do not know where they are going next or what they are going to do but local people are helping. Prayer is of course much needed, especially for the protection staff and for officers of Christian agencies in Kiev, such as Eurovision Mission to Europe, who sent a bulletin out immediately on Thursday morning, which was forwarded to me. It reported how timely it was that David Hathaway of Eurovision was in Kyiv last Sunday for a hastily arranged day of prayer and meetings. The ministry was testified to instances that have shown God with them. Christians have been worshiping God on the Kyiv metro stations. And we must keep our eyes lifted heavenwards. Lord, we pray for peace between nations, and particularly between NATO countries and Russia, and the situation in the Ukrainian border. We've been asked to bring this into our prayers from the diocese today. And I share with you some words from Psalm 29. The Lord shall give strength to his people, and the Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. God of strength and peace, send your blessing on the people of the Ukraine. Sustain them in their struggles. Hold them in their fear. And protect them from all danger. And be for them the hope they desire. 
for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another, and love as he loves us. And Lord, we bring you before you the situation in Croydon with those who are homeless, with no permanent abode, and those who work in the refugee centre, the food bank in Perth, and night watch. Lord, many members of our fellowship are connected with these organisations, and we give thanks for the time that they give and the support. And we pray that those who are not able to have a permanent home, that they may well be supported by these organisations and provided with food and shelter. And Lord, we pray for a transformation in our parish. And this week we are praying in particular for those in Brighton Road, all those who live there, who work there, or travel there. Bless these homes and all who live in them, and protect them from evil, and for all who dwell there to know your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. And in moments of quiet, we bring before you all those who are known amongst our families and friends who are in need of prayer at this time. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints, we commend ourselves and all Christian people to your unfailing love, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And would you please stand? We're going to share the peace together. The peace of the Lord is always with you and also with you. Please share the peace with those around us. So this continues on page 28. Thank you. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give thanks and praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love, you gave us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels send your place to join with them in heaven's song. 
Savior taught us so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. We drink this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which He gave for you, and His blood, which He shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that He died for you, and feed on Him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And say together the prayer of the top of page 15. We do not continue to come to this your table, Master Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, 
but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore declare you and he in us. Amen. I invite you to come forward to receive communion or indeed to receive a blessing. Um, I have three Timothy wafers and I'd like to start with those first. Nick, um, if anybody else would like a green Timothy wafer, please come forward. Thank you.
body and all your pieces. of the communion. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. May we who are partakers at his table reflect his life in word and deed, that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together the prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our final hymn is number 251, Lord, your word shall guide us. If you can, please stand. <laughs> Just a few notices before we conclude. Um, as Bob mentioned, the Archbishops have named today a day of prayer for peace and uh, continuing as we 
I'm sure like me, you were just thinking of the situation of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine uh, throughout this service. On Tuesday at six o'clock, uh, we are encouraged and invited to pray with the diocese in Europe um, for the chaplaincy in Kiev and the churches that serve in Ukraine. Um, I believe more information about joining with the Diocese of Europe will come out uh, in the next day or so. Likewise, on Wednesday, uh, Ash Wednesday, the 2nd of March, is dedicated as a day of prayer and fasting for peace. And to say that we will be holding an Ash Wednesday service at eight o'clock here in church. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.